Hello, everyone. Good morning. Happy Journalism Day. All right. Uh, and so uh, it really, really does seem like uh, just a couple of months ago uh, that we were gathered here uh, for me to welcome you to the campus. Uh, and, you know, with the life cycle of our academic year and uh, the program and all the learning and teaching and all the other things that we do, the year flew by and here we are uh, on the cusp of graduation. Uh, and so, uh, let me be the first uh, to congratulate you as the class of 2023. Uh, and, you know, this will officially kick off uh, our series of events that culminate uh, in graduation. Uh, I would, in, <clears throat> excuse me. I am uh, here, more specifically right now, to introduce our Pringle lecturer. Uh, and this award is named for Henry Pringle, uh, who was a longtime faculty member of the school, uh, Pulitzer Prize winning uh, biographer, and a reporter for the Washington Post. The Pringle lecturer is nominated by our full-time faculty for outstanding, for the person's outstanding coverage of politics and Washington. Uh, and in this case, uh, you can join me in welcoming our 2023 Pringle lecturer, Dahlia Lithwick. Oh. <laughs> uh, I am uh, personally uh, very happy because I've known Dahlia for some time and I've admired her work uh, for uh, many years. And so uh, we're thrilled to have you here with us uh, today. Uh, by way of her background, uh, Dahlia is a senior editor at Slate, and in that capacity has been writing uh, the Supreme Court dispatches and jurisprudence columns since 1999. Her work has appeared in the New York Times, Harper's, The New Yorker, The Washington Post, The New Republic, and Commentary, among other places. She is the host of Amicus, Slate's award-winning bi-weekly podcast about the law and the Supreme Court. In 2018, Dahlia Lithwick received the American Constitution Society's Progressive Champion Award and the Hillman Prize for Opinion and Analysis. Uh, and I was uh, fortunate enough to be on the, on the jury uh, that awarded that uh, and uh, was thrilled then as I am now. Uh, she, was, uh, she won in 2013 a National Magazine Award for her columns on the Affordable Care Act, and she has twice been nominated for an online journalism award for her legal commentary, and she was inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in October 2018. In 2021, she was a recipient of the Women's Media Center's Exceptional Journalism Awards, and that same year, she won a Gracie Award for Amicus Presents, the class of RBG, which featured the last in-person audio interview with Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. She has also held visiting faculty positions at the University of Georgia Law, Georgia Law School, the University of Virginia Law School, and the Hebrew University Law School of, in Jerusalem. She was the first online journalist invited to be on the Reporters Committee for the Freedom of the Press, and she has testified before Congress about access to justice in the era of the Roberts Court and how uh, Me Too impacts federal judicial law clerks. She has appeared on CNN, ABC, The Colbert Report, <laughs> The Daily Show, and is a frequent guest on The Rachel Maddow Show, and she earned her bachelor's degree in English from Yale University and her JD from Stanford University. We could go on, um, but at this point, let's just welcome uh, Dahlia Lithwick. Thank you. The whole time I was listening to that, I was in my head going, shorten bio, shorten bio, it's too long. 
Um, I want to thank uh, Dean Cobb, honored deans, honored faculty, students, congratulations, <laughs> class of 2023. Uh, it is such a profound honor to be invited um, to deliver this year's Pringle Lecture. And I want to just stop and welcome all of you to this sort of dubious, ink-stained, weird club we have called journalism. Um, and I also just want to open by thanking you, because you are entering this profession at a time when becoming a journalist actually takes courage, which is not something uh, I had to say when I became a journalist. I mostly just had to find matching shoes and a clean suit. Uh, you, you guys have a lot of bravery, and I think more urgently, you're entering this profession when the act of becoming a reporter is actually fundamentally an act of hope. And we're going to get to the hope in a minute, but I really want to tell you that this is not a thing that I see you entering into lightly. So it will surprise you not at all to hear that the people out there in the world are very afraid right now. And one of the things they're afraid of sometimes is journalism and journalists and truth and facts. And when people are afraid, they sometimes turn on each other and sometimes they turn on us in this profession. And I think one of the things you're going to have to think about as you do this job is how to use this responsibility, your custodian role with truth and facts, that which is knowable and testable, to help people who are afraid not only be visible to each other, but be visible to journalism and visible to you. I also want to say that it will surprise you not at all to hear that attacks on journalists and on journalism are certainly on the rise, as are attacks on things like reading and books and knowing stuff. <laughs> but in the face of that, it has been a singular time for what is rushed into the void. And what is rushed into the void has been extraordinary. Dogged investigative reporting, the deploying of technology to do work that we couldn't do ourselves, and the inviting of citizen journalists to be part of what was once a way too rarefied profession. We have welcomed, I think, into the void, sometimes grumpily, I say, as an old person, but we have welcomed new forms of journalism to help fill in the gaps of what wasn't getting done. And I'm standing in front of you as somebody who's covered the Supreme Court for 23 years. And my beat, more than perhaps any other, has been wholly upended by the failures of journalism and by the failures of us on this beat. And I say that with great chagrin. But I think a lot of us who did this work kind of fancied ourselves junior law professors. You know, We don't have to pay attention to the justices. We just have to write what changes in the doctrine. We just have to write about what happened to the dormant commerce clause this week without thinking about the institution of the court itself. And so we took dictation probably for decades, and we principally told the story that I think the justices really wanted us to tell about an oracular court, nine brains in vats, calling balls and strikes, doing it nobly and brilliantly, nothing else mattered. And into the void of that story, what rushed in in the past year has been investigative journalism, political journalism, really incredibly brilliant uses of technology that those of us on this beat don't know what it is or how they used it. But suddenly, the court is being covered probably for the first time in my lifetime as a political institution, as a non-oracular branch of government that deserves to be treated with the same scrutiny and sobriety and seriousness as the other branches of government. And so we got 
a Dobbs leak, not covered by the, not uh, ferreted out by the su traditional Supreme Court press corps. We had an investigation into the Dobbs leak, not particularly well covered by those of us who covered the court. We had the uh, uh, ethics violations and the failures to recluse, recuse and to disclose almost entirely covered by the political press and by investigative journalism. And right now at this moment, legacy press are advertising. Do you want to cover the Supreme Court like it's a real thing? We need reporters. It's deeply, deeply embarrassing to be part of a press corps that had such bad Patty Hearst syndrome. We were so in love with our captors that they would just tell us that they were our captors and we would say thank you. The one thing that gives me a little bit of solace in this moment is that somebody reminded me just last week that the Watergate story was not broken by White House reporters. It was broken by DC crime reporters who doggedly chased a story that Washington wasn't really doing a good job of, of uh, ferreting out. And so I stand before you with a tiny bit of sh shame, but a lot of awareness that you don't know that you're covering an institution wrong until somebody from the outside comes in and tells you, oh yeah, by the way, you're covering the institution wrong. And that we were telling a story in black and white for years and years about a court that should have been told in Technicolor. And so now, for the first time in my lifetime, it's not being covered as an oracular branch. There has been a seismic shift, not just in coverage of the court and who covers the court, but in the deep, deep sense that we have to do something different and we don't quite know what it is. So now I want to tell you, because it's that part of the speech, some important rules of journalism stuff that I have learned in almost a quarter of a century covering the courts. And the first and maybe most important is this. I implore you as journalists to be a window and not a mirror. We live in a time where our readers are hungry to hear about themselves. They are desperate to see themselves reflected in what they read. And my favorite emails are the ones that say, Dear Daya, I really love this piece. It reminded me of me. Or alternatively, Dear Daya, this was a pretty good piece, but you forgot about me. But our job as journalists is not actually to serve up a good whacking helping of you to our readers. Our job as journalists is to hold up a window to a world they may not know or understand. And so if you find yourself in your careers getting heaps and heaps and heaps of fan mail that says, oh my god, I totally get this, I totally appreciate this, I saw myself in every word, ask yourself if you're doing it right. Show your reader something new, show them something they've never seen, and tell it to them in a way that they've never heard, and I promise you, you will get much less fan mail, really very little fan mail, but you will be opening a window for them into a world outside their selves and outside their own, what the sociologists call, epistemic bubbles. Two, explain. Explain things because the world is hard and complicated and it is our job, whether we like it or not, to break that down for people. You cannot assume that the complex abstract structures that you take for granted because it's the water that you swim in are clear to everyone. And I think sometimes we make the mistake of performing our own smartness rather than performing our own humility. Rather than saying, you know what? I'm gonna start at a basic thing and make sure we all understand it before we move on. Performing your smartness is almost as dumb as being a mirror because people will say, oh, that person is very, very smart, and they will not have learned anything new. Three, just as much as it's not about your reader, I regret to inform you, it's not just about you. 
The best advice I've ever received as a journalist came from a colleague at Slate who reminded me very early that every minute I spend checking my Twitter follows, checking how many Insta likes, I, I can't even say Insta likes, I don't even know what that means, how many Insta followers I have, every minute you spend curating your brand, take all of that time and use it to perform the service of journalism in the world. That it is as much a violation of trust to make journalism about you as it is to make it about your reader alone. This is a group sport. And thinking about our brand at the expense of the group is one of the ways I think we've gone horribly awry. Four, tell the truth. I'm not going to say anything more about that. Tell the truth. You know how to do it. You've learned here among some of the best people in the country how to tell the truth. When you don't tell the truth, the entire institution of journalism suffers a blow. So tell the truth, not just for yourself and your readers. Tell your truth so that nobody ever can say journalism lies. Five, improbably enough. Be kind, don't punch down, don't humiliate people for the sake of humiliating. Don't use this platform to belittle or reduce others to the best of your ability. Be generous, be open-hearted, and think really, really hard about whether it's worth it to have that sort of like, gotcha, that wrecks somebody's day. Because I think, again, we trade in that as journalists I'm not saying don't hold truth to account. I'm not saying don't hold power to account. But I'm saying have a council of the five best people you know. Read your copy. And when one of the five says, you know what? This is beneath you. Don't publish it. Six, listen. All I've talked about right now until this moment is talking. And I think one of the things that we miss most in the world as journalists is the capacity to hear others. I often joke that it took years for me to figure out how to interview Justice Ginsburg. And let me just say, that was the honor of my life. But the first answer she would reflexively give was always terrible. It was like a vending machine where you put in a quarter and you got the same Snickers bar every time. But then, if you just sat in the weird quiet and she would drop her head down like one of those animatronic dolls at Disneyland, and then she'd lift it up. And if you could wait her out, and sometimes it took six minutes, she would say the most sublime incandescent truth that she'd never said before. And it made me realize that one of the things we have to get much, much, much better at in this profession is making space for people to say what they have to say to us and listening really carefully to their answers. So it's a little bit of that talk less, listen more thing, but it's also, I don't know if we learn nearly enough about how to listen in this culture and in this moment, but I implore you as journalists to just sometimes sit in the quiet for all of its discomfort and wait for the awesome that comes next. Finally, and this is the improbable crazy part. I want to urge you as journalists to have hope. And I know that this is nuts given everything we know about AI and chat GPT can write our stories better than us. And frankly, my teenagers can write my stories on chat GPT better than us. Um, and shrinking newsrooms and nobody going into the office and fake news and uh, you know, foreign interference, and I'm looking at all your faces, and you're all like, why didn't I go to dental school? So here's, here's the answer. The answer is that as all of the deep fakes, all of the um, uh, uh, AI, everything that is coming at us in terms of social media tries to undermine the work that we do, Let's remember, please, that ours is the only profession protected by name in the Constitution. Not the lawyers, not the doctors, not the pollsters. 
the press. And why is that? Why did the framers think that this one and only pro uh, uh, profession required the full protections of the First Amendment? And the answer is, we're not just a check on power. That's part of it. But we are the entity that inspires action. We are the engine that inspires democracy. And I am not asking anyone to lie. I'm not asking you to say things are awesome when they aren't. Sometimes I get very grumpy emails from people saying, like, you should stop writing about vote suppression. It's making people not vote, to which my answer is, it's your job to get people to vote. It's my job to describe what's happening. So I am not by any measure telling you to, to, to put a shiny face on the truth. But what I am saying is that this is a world and a country full of wonder and grandeur and beauty and awe and heroes doing astounding things every day. And we have the singular power and I would say responsibility to lift that up, to make it matter, to help people understand that in a world that feels like it is overcome by nihilism, there is a point and a purpose and there is a path through. So now I wanna to read to you my favorite quote from Howard Zinn. A guy who knew a thing or two about nihilism and hopelessness. He had been an Air Force bombardier during World War II. He saw horrible things. This is what he writes in his 2002 autobiography, You Can't Be Neutral on a Moving Train. Quote, if I could get this tattooed on my arm, I would. It's very long. <clears throat> Quote, to be hopeful in bad times is not just foolishly romantic. It is based on the fact that human history is a history not only of cruelty, but also of compassion, sacrifice, courage, and kindness. What we choose to emphasize in this complex history will determine our lives. If we see only the worst, it destroys our capacity to do something. If we remember those times and places, and there are so many, where people have behaved magnificently this gives us the energy to act, and at least the possibility of sending this spinning top of a world in a different direction. And if we do act in however small a way, we don't have to wait for some grand utopian future. The future, he writes, is an infinite succession of presence, and to live now as we think human beings should live, in defiance of all that is bad around us, is itself a marvelous victory, end quote. So they say that we as journalists are writing the first draft of history, and that means that we are writing this infinite succession of presence. That's what we are giving the world. And you are the warriors now. You are the ones who are going to be chronicling these marvelous victories, these magnificent behaviors, all the ways in which astounding efforts are made to send, to quote Zinn, this spinning top of a world in better directions. Yours is a generation I admire more than I can possibly say, because you don't join stuff, and you certainly don't answer your landline when the pollsters call. But boy, oh boy, do you get things done. And you have vast, capacious hearts and you see potential where sometimes those of us who are a generation or two ahead of you see only disaster. And so I am going to beg you to have hope and to have the certainty that I have that this generation of journalists is going to spin this world to a vastly better place. Congratulations. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Dahlia, that was amazing. You can give him more applause. <laughs> um, 
And now, Professor Joanne Farian will introduce this year's winner of the Mike Berger Award. Hello, congratulations to everyone. Uh, the Meyer Berger Award honors distinguished reporting in the great tradition of the New York Times reporter who set the standard for thought-provoking human interest journalism about everyday life and ordinary people. Since this award honors Berger, as well as the recipient, I want to take just a minute to tell you about him. He began his journalistic career at the age of 12 as an office boy on the New York world. Joseph Pulitzer's paper, and moved to the New York Times in 1928. He's still famous for a story about an unemployed World War II veteran who one day in 1949 stalked through his quiet neighborhood in Camden, New Jersey, firing his Luger pistol into shops and apartment windows, and a car stopped at a red light. Thirteen people died. Berger jumped aboard the first train to Camden, spent six hours there interviewing 50 witnesses, then went back to the office. In two and a half hours, he banged out a 4,000-word story, reconstructing the rampage with precision and vividness. Basically, in less than nine hours, Mike Berger had written a master's project. <laughs> but while he celebrated for that feat, he was loved for his mastery of another genre, the human interest story like the one about the blind man who miscounted his steps on the subway platform and fell in front of the train, or the woman who amassed a collection of half a million wishbones from various kinds of poultry, or the man who was haunted by a guinea pig. Stories that focus on the dramas and the quirks and the sorrows and struggles of everyday life and ordinary people. I'm pleased to award Lindsay Billing the 2023 Meyer Mike Berger Award for her ProPublica story entitled The Night Raids. It's about CIA-directed death squads called Zero Units in Afghanistan that killed countless hundreds. Often raids were based on flawed intelligence and resulted in scores of executions. Farmers, students, and teachers, all with no connection to the Taliban. For over three years, working solo for most of them, Billing did diligent shoe leather reporting across dangerous swaths of Afghanistan. She takes the reader into the shadows of the US war on terrorism that accomplished the opposite of what was intended. It began as a personal quest. Billing's mother and twin sister were killed 30 years earlier in a night raid in the Civil War that followed the defeat of the Soviet Union in Afghanistan. Her father later died in that conflict, in the conflict. She soon learned about the zero units. Billing visited the sites of 30 raids. She interviewed doctors, forensic examiners, eyewitnesses, and family members of civilians shot point blank. She gained the trust of Afga Afghan commandos who questioned their actions, and she interviewed the former Afghan spy who admitted to raids being conducted on flawed intelligence. It's a gripping and powerfully written story, one which should be read by US citizens so they know what is being done in their name. Lindsay? Good morning. And congratulations to all the graduates. It's a huge accomplishment and you should be very proud. I've been a journalist for just six years. Uh, my, all of it, I've worked as a freelancer. And unlike you, I never studied journalism. So to be here now at one of the most prestigious journalism schools in the world accepting an award really is a huge honor. Thank you. This is also a sign that the world of journalism is changing as are the journalists writing the stories. I flew in from Istanbul yesterday, and tomorrow I will return to Afghanistan, a country which, if you haven't been to already, I hope you visit someday. When you descend into the Kabul Basin, surrounded by, blo surrounded by blinding snow-capped mountains, you are left speechless every time. 
I spent the last four years reporting on a much darker side to the country, a secretive American war. For me, the story began in early 2019. In a village in eastern Afghanistan, I met a widow named Mazala. She told me the story of how on a December night in 2018, masked soldiers dropped out of the sky, stormed her small home, and shot and killed her only two children, and then disappeared. She had no answers as to why her sons had been killed. For me, there was an eerie familiarity to her story. Decades earlier, my own mother and sister were killed in a nighttime raid in the exact same district that Mazala's sons were. I had returned to Afghanistan to investigate my own past, but Mazala's story became the driving force behind a new search for answers. It quickly became clear that her story was just one of many. Scores of civilians with no ties to the Taliban or insurgent groups were being killed in night raids by squads of Afghan special forces soldiers who were funded, trained, and directed by the CIA. In nearly every case, the families of those killed were left without explanation. Broken homes, broken families, layers and layers of loss, that is what is left behind now. Since America's exit, Afghans are facing new burdens under the Taliban. Women have been erased from public life and banned from education. Journalists and those who speak truth to power are at risk. The Taliban detained Morteza Behboudi, an Afghan French journalist, in January, and Matou Lawessa, a prominent Afghan campaigner for female education, in March. America's involvement in Afghanistan was often typified by lack of justice and transparency, violence without accountability. But for most Americans, Afghanistan always felt very far away, and this made it easy for America to move on. America's long story in Afghanistan was always, we are making progress. The reality, however, was often far removed from the rhetoric. Afghanistan's story is America's story too. When America left in 2021, analysts rushed to write articles about what went wrong, but Afghans already knew the answer. Though few have the opportunity to tell their own stories. I was an unlikely candidate to become a journalist. I was born to an Afghan father and Pakistani mother, but I was adopted and given a family, British citizenship, and an education, and with that, the opportunity to fight my way into this field. It is only because of the opportunities I was given in life that I am now able to write about my mother and sister and others whose deaths were left unsolved. Opportunities and a lot of hard graft. If luck dealt me a different hand, my fate would have been very different. You have also received a huge opportunity here at Columbia. You are going into a world of journalism that is changing and you have an important role to play. There are almost certainly people in your class who, f who have been told they don't belong here in America. You will cross paths with people every day who feel they don't belong and who you feel are different from you. But storytelling is connection. And as journalists, we carve a new space, a new space for belonging. You might be thinking what kind of journalist you want to be and what kind of stories you want to tell. And narratives have power. Whether you're reporting in Afghanistan or rural Nebraska, you will meet people who will drive you to better understand the complexity of human behavior. And you will tell stories that are necessary for all of us to hear, because they are also all of our story. Ahead of you are many difficult stories and many personal challenges will arise. There is no mold you need to fit as a journalist. Chase stories that are difficult to understand and seek truths that feel elusive. Worry about something bigger than yourself and then write stories that masterfully break our hearts and force change. And most importantly, write for those who need to be cared for. I can tell you that not one of the hundreds of eyewitnesses, survivors, or families of victims that I spoke with believed that anyone over here in America would listen or care. Sadly, Mazala passed away before the story was published. I wish she could have seen the response to her story from readers around the world. Clearly, there are many, many people who do care. You have your own important stories to tell, and I look forward to listening. Thank you.
Lindsay, thank you for that. That was profound. <clears throat> we have one more professional award to present, uh, and that is the Tabankin, the Paul Tabankin Memorial Award. Professor Du Lin Tu will present it to this year's winner. Morning, everyone. Congratulations. All right. Um, uh, I was, uh, that's much better. OK. I was given um, by Dean Huff two minutes to say nice things about the next award winner. We'll see. OK. Um, uh, the Paul Tabanka Memorial Award honors the late New York Herald Tribune reporter and recognizes out outstanding achievements in re reporting on racial and religious hatred, intolerance, or discrimination in the United States. I want to thank my fellow judges, Elena Cabral and Dolores Barclay, who unanimously uh, selected the winner from a highly competitive pool of submissions. Um, the reason I'm so excited to present this award is I, I first met the winner, Yvette Cabrera, uh, on a Zoom box during COVID. And for many months, we, we met on a Zoom box uh, when we were doing this fellowship, and we talked about the work that we were doing. And, and now I finally get to meet her in person. Uh, uh, Kali quickly became uh, a hero of mine, so I'm very, very excited to present this award. Uh, Yvette is a senior reporter at the uh, Center for Public Integrity. Uh, and, um, and her piece, um, looks at the devastating effects of uranium mining on the Navajo Nation. Published with ICT, formerly Indian Country Today, Cabrera's investigation laid bare generations of suffering caused by radioactive waste from hundreds of uranium mines the US government used to make nuclear weapons during the Cold War. Earl Tully, a Navajo activist who tried to hold the government accountable for the multitude of cancers and deaths in his community caused by the toxic waste, was a key source in Cabrera's reporting. Uh, but when Tully discovered during the reporting um, that he had an aggressive form of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, a cancer linked to radiation exposure, he became the centerpiece for the narrative. Uh, Cabrera powerfully traces Tully's story in the Blue Gap Tushy community against a bleak history of destruction and neglect by the U.S. government on Navajo land. The result is a story of unbreakable courage in the face of systemic cruelty. Um, so congratulations, Yvette. morning. First, um, I want to thank uh, the Columbia Journalism School faculty for bestowing this wonderful honor on our Center for Public Integrity story. Um, it's a story that's meant so much to me. I also want to thank my editor, uh, Jamie Smith Hopkins, who shepherded the piece and took my mad jumble of words and made sense of it all. Um, if I can share one piece of advice with you, um, when you have an editor who elevates your work, treasure them, thank them, build a shrine to them, because it's one of the most important relationships you'll have as a journalist. When I started reporting the story in March of 2020, the U.S. was in, a, in crisis mode, responding to a global COVID-19 pandemic that forced many of us, including journalists to change the way we worked. As an environmental justice reporter who covers communities whose residents face health disparities that make them even more vulnerable to the coronavirus, this meant I couldn't be out in the field. So I first connected with Earl Tooley that March by phone as the Navajo Nation was being ravaged by the COVID-19 pandemic. The coronavirus magnify the difficulties of accessing clean water across Navajo Nation, communities where abandoned uranium mining, largely for U.S. nuclear weapons, had left behind a trail of toxic waste that poisoned the groundwater and other water sources. From the very first time I heard Earl's voice, 
calm and steady. It crackled with wisdom. He told me on that very first call that he was in the winter of his life. And his knowledge as a longtime anti-uranium activist and environmental indigenous rights advocate was clear right off the bat. But it was his role as a grandfather, worried about the uranium contamination that still plagued the land of the Diné, that a frailty, a vulnerability came through on that first call. Earl had spent a good portion of his life fighting for just compensation for generations of Navajo uranium mine and mill workers and for downwinders throughout the Southwest who had been exposed to the atomic bomb testing fallout that began during World War II. The first time we spoke, neither of us knew what lay ahead for him, that he too would fall victim to the cancer that had afflicted the Diné for decades. So Earl and I began doing a series of phone interviews, more than half a dozen calls as I worked on the story. Then in 2021, he shared that he had been diagnosed with an aggressive form of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. When I take on an investigation, I always ask myself, from what angle can I best tell this story? And I keep a quote on my desk from John Steinbeck that states, on what point can I stand to see the world or more important to make the world see itself? The story of uranium contamination had been told many times before, but the pandemic, the killing of George Floyd at the hands of police officers, and the racial reckoning that followed forced our country to take a hard look at how we treat black and brown communities. Earl and so many other advocates had been asking Congress for years, why are people still being exposed to radioactive waste nearly 80 years after we began extracting uranium? As one uranium miner, Tommy Reed, put it, how much is a human life worth to them? All of you carry the power via the stories you tell, the beats you cover, and the work that you do to draw attention to the voices calling for change, to the injustices that unfold before us every day in plain sight. The pandemic isolated us in our homes and from the normal interactions we had with each other. And it took a toll, particularly as our politics grew more divisive during the Trump presidency, to be cut off from those neighborly and familial connections that normally sustained us. With this piece, I had the chance to tell the story of a person who understood how important those threads are that connect us as people. Earl spoke of the days as a child, sitting around his family's hearth in Blue Gap, Arizona, having fireside chats every evening. His father would sharpen his ax, filling a tiny brown grocery bag with the filings. And as the fire burned and his family shared the details of their day, Earl's mom would hand a pinch of those ax filings to Earl and his siblings so they could sprinkle it into the fire. And it would light up like a sparkler. It was magic, Earl told me, to look around the fire to see his mom, his dad, his grandparents, and his siblings listening to each other. He remembers his grandfather imagining the day Earl became a grandfather and wondering, what is this place going to look like? What is life going to be like? Will they remember us? What are their stories going to be? As the second winter of the COVID-19 pandemic approached, Earl told me he would be returning to his family's homestead in Blue Gap for a ceremony. He wanted to place his braid, which he had cut during his chemotherapy as his hair began to fall in the fire of his family's hearth. When he invited me to witness the ceremony, I knew I had to be there. It felt so meaningful coming in the midst of a pandemic that had prevented us from building community with one another. So I journeyed to Blue Gap with my husband, a photojournalist who partners with me on projects and is here today to celebrate this honor as well to at last meet the man whose steady, calm voice on the other end of the phone line had been a constant for me since the start of the health crisis. Earl knows that the power of his community stories is that they are deeply rooted in the land, stories shared as families gathered around a fire to pass along the wisdom gleaned from living off that land. For Earl, returning to Blue Gap where he grew up was a way to heal during his battle with cancer. The pandemic, he said, made many families hit pause and focus inward on those connections that do so much to sustain us. 
His words reminded me of a beautiful quote in an article by the cultural anthropologist Polly Wiesner, who studied the power of fireside chats among the Bushmen of Southern Africa. She found that the stories that the villagers shared around the campfire at night built trust, understanding, and cooperation among the community members. As one elder put it, our, our old people long ago had a government, and it was an ember from the fire where we last lived, which we used to light the fire at the new place we were going. My hope for all of you as you set out into the world to report, explore, and cover these very important times is that you remember that like the ax that Earl's father sharpened every night, the work we do as journalists is built on the trust we earn with the people we cover, slow and steady. This work takes time, it requires patience, sometimes it requires a year and a half wait and a day and a half drive from California to Arizona to at last meet the person at the heart of your story. Make that commitment and you'll find the people and stories that spark change. Take the journeys that allow you to witness the chemistry that unfolds around the campfire. Dedicate yourself, as painful as it is, to writing and rewriting until you achieve that alchemy of words that convey the truth of the world. It's magic, as Earl says, when we share our stories. After graduation day, you'll begin your own journeys in this noble profession with a pen and notepad to do as Paul Tabenkin once did, as John Steinbeck once did, to make the world see itself, to do as Earl has done, passing his stories on to the next generation, or as he puts it, to serve as a bridge and speak up with all the words that were not spoken. Thank you. Congratulations again, Yvette. And now we will begin with the presentation of student awards. The first award will be presented by Professor Elisa Solomon. Um, congratulations, everybody. Um, I'm very pleased to be invited to present the Nona Balakian Award, which was established in 1992 to honor the student who shows promise for achievement in writing about literature. Ms. Balakian, a 1943 graduate of the Journalism School, was an editor at the New York Times Book Review and had much influence on American arts and letters for more than four decades. For a lively and insightful profile of an author of interactive books for children, of blockchain fairy tales, and of branching narratives in a range of media, this year's Balakian Prize for writing about literature goes to Mahika Agarwal. Uh, the next award will be presented by Aaron Texera, class of 1995. Hello, it's wonderful to be back. So, Professor Richard Blood, he was a much loved, no nonsense professor. He was an old school newspaper man. Famous for his eyebrows, his brusque style, and his deep passion for covering New York City. When he retired, a group of his former students, myself included, established this award in his name to honor the best investigative hard news or news feature story, with a focus on New York City mostly, uh, for, his thought, for a thoughtful analysis of legislation aimed at protecting workers endangered by climate change, the Richard J. Blood Reporting Award goes to Tamia Folks. 
The story is Beat the Heat. <laughs> the next award will be presented by Professor Mark Hansen and Professor Dramil Mehta. All right, good morning uh, and congratulations. Um, each year, the Brown Tau Award celebrates the best in computational journalism. For 2023, the award goes to a deeply reported data-rich story about the dangerous immigration routes to the US followed by thousands of Indians, primarily from the states of Punjab and Haryana. Also known as donkey paths, these trips cross several continents before reaching the states. Long, dangerous, and expensive journeys, all packaged and advertised and ultimately documented on TikTok, YouTube, and other online platforms. For this imp impressive blend of computation and shoe leather reporting, the Brown Town Award goes to Tazbia Fatima. Makes me so happy. Um, uh, the next award will be presented by Keith Goggin, class of 1991. Good morning and congratulations to the class of 2023. I'm Keith Goggin, as Mark just mentioned, um, and I'm a member of the class of 1991. I'm also the former chair of the Columbia Alumni Association, and I'm a current member of the Board of Trustees here at Columbia. So I am many things Columbia. I am privileged to stand before you this morning on behalf of the Columbia Alumni Association to honor one of Columbia's most impactful trustees and a true university treasure, Bill Campbell. And that is through the presentation of this year's Campbell Award winner to one of your own. When we welcome you into our ranks tomorrow morning, membership in the CAA will expand to 390,000 living alumni, a worldwide group network with over 100 clubs and shared interest groups. As you join this vibrant group, I encourage you to take advantage of all the CAA has to offer. Before I present this morning's award, I'd like to say a few words about Bill Campbell himself. Bill was the trusted mentor and confidant of Steve Jobs, Tim Cook, Larry Page, Eric Schmidt, Mark Zuckerberg, and countless other tech titans. But Columbia held a special place in Bill's incredibly generous heart. He was a graduate of the college and of Teachers College. As a student, he was co-captain of the football team, and he later became that team's head coach. From 2005 to 2014, Bill was the chair of Columbia's Board of Trustees. And during that time, he was the co-founder and champion of the Columbia Alumni Association. It is fair to say that without Bill Campbell, there might not even be a CAA. Perhaps the keystone of the CA's accomplishments has been the development of a culture of what we call university citizenship. A university citizen thinks not only of their own school or of themselves, but of the entire university and all of its stakeholders. A university citizen recognizes that we can all become better by working together. Bill Campbell embodied this concept better than anyone, and his example has inspired many of us to do the same. Established in 2016 upon Bill Campbell's death and presented each year at graduation, the Campbell Award recognizes one student from each of Columbia's schools who has exhibited Bill's generosity of spirit, his quality of leadership, and his devotion to university citizenship. This year's J School Campbell Award winner is a member of the part-time MA program. She is a neurodivergent disability advocate who founded and serves as president of the Columbia Student Disability Network and the Columbia Journalism School Alliance of Journalists with Disabilities. On April 22nd, on her initiative, Columbia held its first Disability Affinity Graduation, which was also the university's first all-school affinity graduation. Bill Campbell would be proud. 
I had the opportunity to meet your Campbell Award winner last night when the CAA celebrated the Campbell Award winners from across the university at the Columbia Alumni Center on 113th Street. I got to know her inner circle and we bonded over baseball. At its core, journalism is about great stories and this year's J School Campbell Award winner is the embodiment of a great story. It gives me great pleasure to present the Campbell Award to Leslie Zucker. The next award will be pres presented by Lisa Cohen. Hello, congratulations to everyone. I bet you're never sick of hearing that. I'm Lisa Cohen. I am the director of the DuPont Columbia Awards for audio and video journalism, broadcast, online, documentary, and I look forward to seeing your submissions in the years to come. But today, this is uh, I'm going to be awarding a student award, the DuPont Judy F. Crichton Award, which was established in honor of a pioneer in documentary filmmaking, Judy Crichton. She produced docs for CBS Reports and ABC News and was the founding executive producer of PBS's series, American Experience. Judy was a role model for many filmmakers, including Professor June Cross and me, at a time when the filmmaking profession was dominated by men. This year, we have a, a winner and an honorable mention. Uh, the award goes to a film that explores the pleasures, promise, and pain of living as a black trans woman of color. With extraordinary access, Mother Wit portrays a nuanced and sensitive look at the love and support within a chosen family headed by the extraordinary Mother Latravios. The award goes to Tashima Anusha Brennan and Rajvi Desai. But wait, there's more. Honorable mention goes to a short that portrays the family bonds between two sisters separated by a war, but united by love. This short was picked up by the PBS program POV before the filmmaker had even graduated. Call Me Anytime, I'll Be Home is directed by Sanjna Selva. She cannot be here today because she is in Italy for the European premiere of her film. The next awards will be presented by Dean John Haskins. The tall people are back. <laughs> I have a couple awards today. The Philip Greer Scholarship Fund Award, presented for the first time in 1988, was established in honor of the late Philip Greer, a financial correspondent and columnist for the New York Herald Tribune and the Washington Post, to recognize the outstanding financial writing in the Master of Arts and Master of Science programs. So the two winners are, for the Masters of Science winner, is Jacob Indersky. Yeah.
and the Master of Arts winner, Kevin Flores. You can clap him up. Clap him across the stage. Come on. <laughs> also today, the Fred M. Heckinger Journalism Education Award was established by the Heckinger Institute of Media Education at Teachers College and is awarded for insight and excellence in reporting and writing on the subject of education. For a master's project that revealed the scandal of New York public schools inflating graduation rates by the rampant overuse of special grade, a special grade for incomplete work that was permitted during the pandemic, the 2023 Fred M. Heckinger Journalism Education Award goes to Amanda Gadul. The next award will be presented by Professor Michael Shapiro. This is what you call an action item. Uh, <laughs> all right public speaking. Um, congratulations. Good morning. How are you? Great. Um, <laughs> this is the editorial award where people get to offer their opinions, and a lot of you did really, really well in this. We, uh, Professor Azmat Khan and I were the judge of this contest, and I think it's fair to say, yes, Azmat, that oh, you guys have interesting things to say and say it very well, but somebody had to win. And four, her incisive analysis of the rise of South Asian matrimonial law shows and their lack of critical and complex discourse, their journalism editorial award goes to Mihika Agalala. <laughs> The next award will be presented by Professor Sheila Cornell. Congratulations, everyone. The Peter Keller Prize honors excellent editing skills. It was created to honor Keller, who spent 56 years 56 years, at the Wall Street Journal, where he started in the composing room and rose to national news editor. As night editor for over 25 years, he created one of the highest editing standards in the nation. He trained several generations of reporters and editors who call him the living legend of the journal. For her work as managing editor of the Covering Religion website, for which she redesigned the site, updated the template, and created a wonderful showcase for classwork, as well as her leadership of the class's traveling newsroom operating out of hotel lobbies. The Peter Keller Prize goes to Sarah Cutler. <laughs>
The next award will be presented by Professor Dulin Tu. The Joan Connor Broadcast Journalism Award is presented to the MS student who has produced the most thought-provoking and original television or radio reporting. It was established by Dean Emerita, um, Emerita Joan Connor, class of 1961, who had a long and award-winning career as a producer for WNET Channel 13. The winner of the award is Brendan McInerney. Special, special prize. Uh, Brendan is out of town, so his mother, Mary Ann McInerney, is accepting on his behalf. You did good, Mom. The next award will be presented by Professor Sam Friedman. Thanks for your patience. <laughs> um, before going on to a student of board, I want to correct uh, an oversight or fact check our program today and say there's also a very important faculty award that's going to be bestowed at commencement tomorrow, and that is to our own, whoops, Professor Michael Shapiro, who won the Presidential <laughs> Award for Teaching. Okay, now that our collective conscience can rest easier. Um, the Linton Fellowship in Book Writing is funded by the Linton Foundation, and it's intended to encourage excellence in nonfiction writing by young, new, up-and-coming authors. There are two Linton Fellowships each year presented to students in the book seminar, and the order in which they're given has no relevance. They're weighted equally. The first award-winning student has a proposal about America's little-known empire in the Pacific, or at least little-known by many Americans, and specifically about two islands in that empire. Kwajalein, where American military personnel live cosseted lives, supported by taxpayers with golf courses and supermarkets and beaches, and more importantly, Ebea, a nearby island where Marshall Island indigenous people have been turned into an exploited, nearly captive workforce, underpaid, subjected to what still looks like Jim Crow segregation that was supposedly outlawed in this country decades ago. That student is Peter McKenzie. <laughs> For the second winner of the Linton Fellowship, you might think of a young Tennessee political leader named Justin Pearson, whom a lot of us just got to know about very recently when he was one of two young black legislators and one white ally legislator who were censured by the Republican supermajority in Tennessee for their protest in the legislative chambers about the lack of gun control legislation but the person who won this award knows the long arc of the Pearson family history, which goes back to the sanitation workers' strike that had brought Martin Luther King to Memphis on his last pilgrimage. And the route from then till now is the story of the struggle by black Memphians and some recent white allies for environmental justice. 
the author of the book proposal that won the award and ultimately what I hope for them and for Peter as well will be the finished book is Lou Palmer. The next awards will be presented by Jane Eisner. Thank you and congratulations to everyone. The Arthur J. Harris Memorial Prize allows a leading MA student to complete an ambitious story. For his proposal to report on the resurgence of extractive mining in the American West, where the push for renewable energy sources conflicts with environmental protection and indigenous rights, the Arthur J. Harris Memorial Prize is awarded to Ryan Cost. The MA Thesis Prize recognizes excellence in original reporting and fine storytelling. For the victims of Bitcoin City, a sweeping investigation into the government of El Salvador's plans to build a city and an airport on land that is now home to farmers and fishermen, placing a risky bet on cryptocurrency and tourism without regard to local communities the second runner-up for best MA thesis goes to Nelson Rauda Zabla. For punishment is all we have to offer, a dramatic narrative about one crusading lawyer's attempt to convince the courts that prisoners in the United States have a right to medical care. The first runner-up for best MA thesis goes to Ryan Koss. And finally, for the false promises of the Refuge Ranch, a heartbreaking, deeply reported story of the Texas Christians who brought concerns about sex trafficking to political prominence only to fail the survivors they pledged to help, the first place award for best MA thesis this year goes to Willow Grace Higgins. <laughs> Thank you. 
The next award will be presented by Professor Ari Goldman. When I was a student here, many years ago, my reporting professor, we called it RW1 back then, my reporting professor was Melvin Mencher, a highly demanding but lovable character, at least in retrospect, lovable, but at the time it seemed like torture. Um, upon Mencher's retirement in the early 1990s, a group of his students established an award in his name to recognize the kind of reporting that Mencher championed, hard-nosed explorations of difficult social issues. I helped judge this year's award together with Professor Isaac Bailey. The two of us took a stack of awards. We narrowed it down to two. Um, and then we decided to leave the choice up to Professor Mencher himself. Um, we figured we'd make it easy for him. After all, he's 96 years old, and um, it gives me an opportunity every year to visit with him. So we let him make the final decision. I printed out the two finalists and walked the entries over to his apartment on Riverside Drive. I want a story with impact, he told me, as he does every year. <laughs> and no one source stories. Professor Mencher found what he was looking for. He chose a story about the prison at Rikers Island. By all accounts, to be locked up at Rikers is a terrible fate. To be in solitary confinement at Rikers is even worse. One inmate likened it to hell. The winner of the Mencher Award writes powerfully about the efforts to force Rikers to adhere to a new state law that limits the amount of time that inmates can spend in solitary. The writer even manages to get into the prison and interview 10 inmates about their experiences in solitary. No one source stories. The 2023 Mentor Award goes to Esther Amanalu. I will accept the award on her behalf, <laughs> but congratulations. Um, the next award will be presented by Professor Azmat Khan. The Henry N. Taylor Award was established in 1962 by friends of Henry Taylor a journalist who was killed on assignment in the Congo at the age of 31. The award is given annually to a student in the International Division who's demonstrated the qualities of a superior journalist. The award includes a grant providing for travel in the United States before returning to their home country. This year, the award goes to Mansi Vitlani. Congratulations, Mansi. The next award will be presented by Dean Winnie O'Kelly. Hello, everyone. The James Wenchler Memorial Awards were established by the Pisces Foundation in memory of the former editor and columnist at the New York Post. 
The first Winslow Award goes to the student who submits the best story on a significant international issue for his perceptive and sensitive reporting about a little-known community of anti-Zionist religious Jews who support Palestinians, the James A. Winchler Memorial Award for international reporting goes to Gregory James Dobat. <laughs> Okay, the second Wenschler Award is presented to the student who, in the opinion of the faculty, submits the best story on a significant national issue for her sensitive and careful reporting on a difficult topic, mourners turning to Facebook to share their grief over losing loved ones to COVID-19. The James A. Wenschler Memorial Award for national reporting goes to Sarah Cutler. Okay, just one more here. The third Weschler Award is presented to the student who, in the opinion of the faculty, submits the best story on a significant local issue. For a story about the attempts to clean up the Sawmill River and to make sense of the many factors that led to its becoming so polluted, the Weschler Award for local reporting goes to Daniel Shaler. <laughs> And now the next award will be presented by Professor Jonathan Weiner. I'm pleased to present the Lewis Winnick Prize. It's endowed by the Winnick family and is given for the best story about New York City. For the van dwellers of New York City, a well-reported and empathetic look at what it's like to live in a parking spot on a dead-end street in Williamsburg. This year's Winnick Prize goes to Carolyn Bissonette. <laughs> man who needs no introduction. <laughs> uh, and so, can I just say, it, it, you know, it's really amazing um, that you all are the first class in which I've been dean. Uh, and so I feel a, oops, a particular kind of pride, um, almost like you all the first pancakes you know, <laughs> it was like, and they came out good, you know, <laughs> all right. <laughs> um, I would like to recognize uh, those Master of Science students who will graduate with honors. Uh, please stand as I read your name, and I ask that you hold your applause until all names have been read. Carrie Anderson. 
Do not, do not. Do so. <laughs> if there's any sentence that, the most ignored sentence in the English language is please hold your applause until the end. Nobody ever pays attention to that. Selena Arredondo, Jesse Blazer, Alyssa Castles, Sarah Cutler, Amanda Gedold. <laughs> it's like technically we're not clapping. <laughs> Aaron Simon Gross. <laughs> Elon Ireland. <laughs> Are we snapping fingers too? Is that gonna happen? <laughs> Margaret Jane Kelly. <laughs> Alan Q, Kevin Lind, Monica Montero Lim, Brendan McInerney, Churchill Donwe, David Newton, Anahita Sashdev. Daniel Shaler, Jennifer Streeter, yeah. Isabel Lynette Tier, and Mansi Vithlani. You can applaud now. Now for the award of the Pulitzer Traveling Fellowships, uh, which are part of Joseph Pulitzer's founding legacy to the school. They are designed to enable travel and study abroad. Four of them allow students to observe people, politics, society, and the character of the foreign press. One fellowship is presented to a student who wishes to specialize in criticism of the arts, drama, music, literature, film, or television. For all winners, for all the winners, the award is a mark of achievement and a sign of accomplishments to come. The Pulitzer Traveling Fellowship for a student with a special interest in arts and criticism goes to Radia Chowdhury. A second fellowship goes to Alan Q. Yeah, come on. A third goes to Kevin Lind. The fourth goes to Amanda Gedold.
The final fellowship goes to the top graduate, our valedictorian of the MS class, Margaret Jane Kelly. I'm old enough to remember a TV show called The Price is Right. <laughs> you call people's name and they come this way and that way. Um, this concludes the Journalism Day ceremony. Uh, congratulations to all of you. And we will see you tomorrow.